A good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for another installment of our video PowerPoint series for Unit 8, Evolution. So today, what we're going to be talking about primarily is Darwin and natural selection. We're also going to be discussing the various theories at the time, as well as the theorists that led to Darwin's creation of the theory of natural selection. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I will see you on the next slide. So evolution is a theory just like gravity. So evolution is a very well supported explanation of phenomena that have occurred in our natural world. So remember, a theory in science is a well-tested hypothesis, not just a guess. So we have a lot of evidence to go ahead and to support this, that evolution does exist, such as fossil record, genetic records, uh, homologous and analogous structures, but we can't really 100% prove it. So it's just something to keep in mind. So Charles Darwin was born in about 1809 and died about 1882. Now from the years of 1831 to 1836, he sailed around the world. So as you can see here, he went ahead and started off in Britain. Now from here, he went down to South America, looped around a little bit, and long story short, he ended up at a place called the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands are very important because Darwin made most of his discoveries that led to the creation of the theory of natural selection on these islands. So the question here is what did Darwin's travels reveal? Why is all this important? So what he found was the diversity of living species was far greater than anyone had previously known at that point. These observations led him to develop the theory of evolution. So if you go ahead and look right down here, what do you think you're looking at? All of these are varieties of beetles. So we've got beetles of various sizes, various shapes, various structures. I mean, if you look here, like the rhinoceros beetle, it's got two large pinchers and then a horn coming off the top. Whereas this guy down here, check out these legs, dude. They're gigantic. So each of these, though different in structure, is a beetle. That's diversity right there. So the diversity on the Galapagos Islands. What he noticed that was that each island had its own type of tortoises as well as birds that were clearly different from other islands. So what he saw here, these are just a selection of the various finches or small birds that he saw on the islands. So he noticed that, well actually I don't want to give it away. What are you noticing, do you think, with these finches? Do you see a difference between them? Take a little bit. Well, if you look close, it's the beak. Each of these beaks are different. So for example, this one in the middle, the beak is primarily used for cracking open seeds. And then starting off from the left and moving our way right, we have uh, birds' beaks that were primarily used for grubs, in, uh, sorry, leaves, insects. This guy right here is pretty cool because he actually will use a tool. So he'll actually go ahead and use a twig to pry grubs out of trees. We also have birds that have sharper beaks that are used for grabbing grubs, as well as up here in the upper right, birds with thick, strong beaks used for cracking open buds and eating fruit. So each of these, though they are finches, have different structures or different variations depending on where they live. Now speaking of the tortoises, we talked briefly about the finches, but check these out. Look at that thing. It's gigantic. So each island also had its own specific variety of tortoises, and none of them being, well, tiny. They're huge. So, if you notice here, the differences are primarily the shells. So this one on the top has a large, kind of sturdy tank-like shell, which it uses to go ahead and push itself through the underbrush. So this guy primarily eats things off of the ground. Or if you look down here at the bottom, this one has a shell that's raised in the front. So what that allows the tortoise to do is it goes ahead and allows it to stretch out its neck to reach fruit on low-hanging trees. Once again, all tortoises 
but they have specific variations depending on where they live and what type of food they eat. So the influences on Darwin's theories. There were a wide variety of different theories running around at the time, each of which had a slight influence on Darwin. The first was the Earth itself. So religion at the time stated that the Earth was around, give or take, 6,000 years old, which, in a time span of history, not really that long. Now, a man by the name of Lyle argued that the Earth has to be many millions of years old. His reasoning for this was that layers of rock take time to form. Uh, those of you that came from Earth science, this should kind of be a rehash. Also, processes such as volcanoes and earthquakes shape the Earth as we know it today and are still occurring, so they're still changing the Earth. So, primarily with uh, Earth and rock, the further down you go, the older it gets. So that's showing you that over time, we've had new rock layers develop, which has led to the various changes that we see. Some other scientists include a man by the name of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who had the theory of acquired characteristics, or as the way I like to explain it, the Disney theory. His theory was that organisms acquired traits by using their bodies in new ways. And these characteristics were then passed on to the offspring. So if you go ahead and take a look here, originally we have a very short, stubby little neck giraffe. A sad little short neck giraffe. And the giraffe wanted to go ahead and eat the leaves that were high up on the trees. So every day, he went out and stretched his neck as far as he could. Now because he worked so hard, his offspring had longer necks. And that eventually led to the giraffes that we see today. Now that's why I call this the Disney theory, because just by going ahead and wishing and really, really giving it your all, you can change future generations. Unfortunately, this is not a Disney movie. Lamarck was wrong. Now, another example of this would be, well, it's no surprise for those of you that uh, I've taught, it's a goal of mine to swim with sharks, specifically to punch a shark. Now, if I did that, and unfortunately it screwed up and I lost an arm, if this theory was true, that would mean that if I had no left arm, my children would also be missing a left arm. Well, for example, a bodybuilder. So a bodybuilder, you know, they're pretty stacked, pretty beefy, pretty gigantic. Now that means that the traits that they acquired by using their body in that way would be passed on to the offspring. So the baby would come out of the womb absolutely stacked. Can you picture that, a jacked baby? Just muscles on muscles, a ripped baby? That's terrifying. So like we said, that's not how it works, unfortunately. Another one was Thomas Malthus. So Malthus stated that if the human population continued to grow unchecked, sooner or later there would be insufficient living space and food for everyone. So what he's stating here is that we have to compete for resources such as food and shelter. So overpopulation. If there's nothing to stop a population from growing over time, it'll gradually start to use up all the resources that it has until, well, it eventually becomes extinct. So as we see here, down in this little chart, this is the projected global population. So as we're slowly approaching 2020, what's happening to our population over time? It seems to be increasing. So unless something happens, we might actually run out of food and shelter for everybody on the planet. Just food for thought. So Darwin, with all these theories in mind, this led to his creation of his book called The Origin of Species. Other naturalists such as Alfred Wallace were developing the same theory as Darwin's around the time. So even though Darwin was afraid of the church's reaction to his book, he wanted to get credit for his work. Now I just want to talk about Alfred Wallace for just a little bit here. Wallace, <sighs> Wallace was very unlucky. So much like Darwin, Alfred Wallace was sailing around the world collecting different species and he came to the same conclusion. 
that Darwin had. Unfortunately, while he was returning, his boat burned down and he lost everything. So when he saw that Darwin was developing the same theory that he was, he made sure to get in contact with him and say, hey, look, it's not just you. I was doing the same thing here. You've got to let the people know. So with help from Wallace and the fact that he wanted to get credit for his work, this led to Darwin releasing The Origin of Species. So a quick summary of natural selection here. There's a bit of notes, so um, just pause the video if you need to. So the first is organisms differ. And those differences or variations are inherited. So they're passed on from one generation to the next. Also, organisms produce more offspring than survive, normally, with most cases. For example, think, um, think flies. When flies reproduce, they lay thousands, or maybe not thousands, but hundreds of eggs in hopes that some will actually live long enough to go ahead and reproduce and pass those traits on. Also, organisms compete for resources such as food, shelter, mates. So there's a wide variety of different resources that organisms need, and they compete for them. Also, organisms with advantages will survive to pass those advantages on to their children. Survival of the fittest. Now, this does not mean the strongest will always win. What this means is that whatever organism has the best set of traits to survive in its environment will survive and pass those on to the next generation, carrying on the traits. Also, species alive today are descended with modifications from a common ancestor. So over time, much like with the finches, we can say that at one point they probably all came from the one original species of finch. But as they went to different areas, different islands, and had to adapt and uh, well, change their environment, they gradually began to split and diverge. So, quick summary here of Darwin's points. So, we have a wide variety of different organisms. Organisms differ and variation is inherited. Is this observed, a theory, or a hypothesis? That would be observed. We can see this in everyday life. Our next one, we see little baby turtles here. So all these baby turtles are trying to get back to the ocean. Unfortunately, there's a decent amount of them that probably won't make it. So, organisms produce more offspring than survive. Is this observed, a theory, or a hypothesis? If you said observed, once again you'd be correct. So we can see this in nature. Now that is just beautiful. Organisms compete for resources. Observed, theory, or hypothesis. Once again, this is observed. We can see this in everyday, everyday life. People are competing. So the next point I'd like to talk about here is take a look at what we've got. We've got four different finches, each one that looks slightly different and that has a different beak. And this is the title to the children's book, Gazelle Has a Very Bad Day. So as you can see here, the python is slowly going ahead and ingesting the gazelle. Ah, oh, yes, and here we are, the elusive brood shark. So, it looks like we have one shark being eaten by another who is being eaten by another who is being eaten by yet another. So organisms with advantages survive to pass those advantages on to their children. What do we think? Observed, a theory, or a hypothesis? Once again, this can actually be observed. Why? Because traits that aren't very advantageous aren't really seen that often. All right, point five of five. So we have the orangutan, the gorilla, the chimpanzee, and the bonobo, followed by the human. And here we have the famous picture of human evolution. So species alive today are descended with modifications from a common ancestor. Observed, a theory, or a hypothesis. This would be a theory.
We have a lot of evidence to support that this is how it works, but once again, we can't 100% prove it. Hence, why we call it a theory. So our big question here is, what exactly is evolution? I mean, we talked about natural selection, but how does this relate to how organisms evolve and change over time? So evolution primarily are the changes in living organisms over time. Well, it's like I just said that. This explains how modern organisms have descended from more ancient organisms. So over time, much like what Darwin said here, organisms change. So there was a common ancestor and through the years there have been variations that have occurred that led to the creation of a new organism or species. This is primarily carried out through fitness and adaptation. So organisms have to compete for limited resources, and some organisms are more fit than others, meaning they have a better chance of actually attaining those resources, reproducing, or finding shelter. So fitness is the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce in its specific environment. So think about it like this, a great white, great white shark, in the ocean, its fitness is fantastic for its area. However, if you go ahead and put a great white shark in, say, the desert, it's got an incredibly low fitness. It wouldn't survive very long there at all. Also, we have adaptations. Adaptations are any inherited characteristics that increase an organism's chance of survival, including reproduction. So these are any characteristics such as camouflage, um, hunting methods, anything like that, that increase an organism's chance of surviving and ultimately reproducing. So what determines survival? So traits that help individuals survive include anything that helps it survive predators or avoid them, such as camouflage or certain gimmicks that allow them to escape, uh, survive disease, so immunity to certain sicknesses, compete for food, or compete for territory. Traits that help individuals reproduce include anything that allows it to help attract a mate, compete for nesting sites, and successfully raise their young. So if you look down here at the uh, peacock, the peacock normally the more colorful and extravagant the peacock is, the better chance it has of attracting a mate. So that's a trait that allows peacocks to help reproduce. So natural selection. The first thing is, there ha for natural selection to occur, there have to be variation in traits. For example, some beetles here are green, and others are brown, and let's say this is a desert environment. So there is a, uh, sorry, there is differential reproduction. Since the environment can't support unlimited population growth, not all individuals get to reproduce to their full potential. So in this example, the green beetles tend to get eaten by birds and survive less often to reproduce than brown beetles do. Why? This is the desert, and the green beetles stick out like a sore thumb. So not all the beetles get to live to reproduce and pass their traits on. However, the brown beetles, which can blend in pretty well to their environment, do get to live and reproduce and pass that trait on. So over time, you're going to see more brown beetles than you would green. So there is heredity. Just like we said before, the surviving brown beetles have brown beetle babies because the trait has a genetic basis. So over time, we'll see way more brown beetles than we would green. So the end result is natural selection. The more advantageous trait, in this case, brown coloration, which allows the beetle to have more offspring, becomes more common in the population. If this continues, eventually all individuals in the population will be brown. Why? Because the green coloration was a huge disadvantage to have. It was causing the uh, beetles to go ahead and get eaten. So natural selection. Over time, natural selection results in changes in the inherited characteristics of a population. These changes often intend to increase a species' fitness in its environment. So, organisms want to live, they want to survive, they want to pass their genes on. So anything that helps them do that is going to get passed on. So let's say a certain coloration helps you hide from predators, like with the beetles. 
over time, that coloration is going to become more popular. More individuals are going to have it. So sources of genetic variation. We have things like gene flow. So with gene flow, this is a movement of genes from one population to another. So primarily things like migration, taking all the genes in a population from one area and moving it to another. A mutation. A mutation, like we said before, is any change in the DNA sequence. So some mutations can affect an organism's fitness, while others have no effect at all. They're silent. Gene shuffling. So gene shuffling, we're talking about independent assortment. So that is when the traits go ahead and split during anaphase 1. They do so independent of one another, creating more variation. Crossing over, same thing, but during prophase 1, certain parts of homologous chromosomes can cross over with each other, creating more variation. And sexual reproduction, which sperm meets with which egg, thus increasing the overall variation in a population. So evolution is genetic change. Natural selection determines which alleles are passed from one generation to the next. As a result, it can change the relative frequencies of alleles in a population over time. The important thing to walk away with from this is that evol uh, evolution is a change in the relative frequency of alleles in a population's gene pool. So it's not evolution unless we're changing the overall genes or variations found in a population. So evolution acts on populations, but not on individuals. So let's say that one day uh, a human goes ahead and grows wings that work. They can't say, hey, I evolved, because that's just one person. If that ends up being an advantageous trait, then maybe hundreds and hundreds of years from now we could consider that evolution. But that's only if it was advantageous, and only if it changes the population uh, gene pool. So in terms of genetic drift, what we're talking about is natural selection is not the only source of evolutionary change. Genetic drift is a random change in the allele frequency. So in small populations, individuals that carry a particular allele may leave more descendants than others individuals, just by chance. So even though it's not the most advantageous trait to have, there still might be more of them. So over time, a series of chance occurrences of this type can cause an allele to become more common in population. So what we're talking about here is genetic drift is a random change. So it's not the most advantageous trait to have, but just uh, because of a random occurrence, it ends up being the most prominent. The founder effect. So the founder effect occurs when a small group of individuals colonizes a new habitat. So members of the colony may carry alleles in different relative frequencies from the larger population from whence they came. So the population that they found will be genetically different from the parent population. So let's say a specific subset of birds. Let's say they've got curved beaks. Move from an area where they have straight beaks and curved beaks to an island where there's nothing yet. So all the curved beaks are now on a separate island. So the population over time of the curved beaks will become so different from the original that they'll be considered a separate species. The final one we're going to talk about is genetic equilibrium. So what happens when no changes at all take place? Well, this is what we call genetic equilibrium. Evolution does not occur because the allele frequencies remain constant. There's no change. There's no... everything just stays the same. So five conditions that need to be met to maintain genetic equilibrium are there's no random mating, there is a large population, there's no movement into or out of the population, so the genes are just becoming stagnant, there's no mutation, and as such there can be no natural selection. Why? Because nothing is advantageous to have. Well, that's about going to go ahead and close us up for our first note section here for Unit 8, evolution. I'd like to go ahead and thank you for joining us, and in summary, remember what we talked about today were the various theorists that led to Darwin creating the theory of natural selection, what Darwin's theory of natural selection actually was, and how evolution can occur over time. So I'd like to thank you again for joining us, and until next time, I will see you in the next video. You all keep it classy.